Welcome to episode 71 of Sharing Life Lessons. This is season 8. We are one spirit, one soul, and together we are creating a library of stories and life lessons. I am your host, Hamida, and I want to bring you stories because stories matter, stories inspire, stories teach, and stories heal. Listeners, I am super charged and super excited about this first episode of season eight. I welcome you again to it, and I'm looking forward to bringing you another 10 episodes with amazing guests who will share life lessons that we can use in our daily lives to not only enhance the quality of our own lives, but also that of everyone around us. The good news is that Sharing Life Lessons has expanded and has started a new YouTube channel. During my introduction of episode number 65, I had expressed my desire to reach 10,000 downloads as a target. By episode 69, that target was reached. I believe that everything I aim for and express to my listeners comes true. It is as if I'm putting it out there to the universe and the universe is making it happen through all of you. Thus, I am going to take this opportunity to express that my next target is to get 1,000 subscribers to the new YouTube channel by my birthday on October 15th. You cannot see me, but my fingers are crossed. The link to the new YouTube channel of Sharing Life Lessons is in the show notes in bold. Please subscribe to it and do ask your friends and family to subscribe to it as well. Because my mother always said that all new beginnings should be started with good thoughts and good intentions. I would like to start this new season, new episode, and new YouTube channel with a beautiful quote. Reads, Everyone has their own path. Walk yours with integrity and wish all others peace on their journey. When your paths merge, rejoice for their presence in your life. When the paths are separated, return to the wholeness of yourself. Give thanks for the footprints they left on your soul and embrace the time now to journey on your own. My favorite line in this quote is, give thanks for the footprints they left on your soul. Beautiful, isn't it? Now over to introducing our wonderful guest for today. I have known him for over a decade. He holds my respect. He is a senior advisor for supervisory and regulatory policy at the Honorable Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I can't wait to hear about his work there and his stories from while he was working at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, where he and I met. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Chris Calabia. Chris, welcome to Sharing Life Lessons. I am not only delighted, but I am honored that you're starting us off with our eighth season of Sharing Life Lessons. This is the first episode of the eighth season for Sharing Life Lessons. And Chris, I am so glad that you're the guest for it. Thank you for starting us off. Amida, thank you so much for inviting me to this wonderful show. I've had a chance to listen to some of the episodes and I know you brought some great guests in before me, so I'm quite honored to be here. Thank you. Chris and I both met when I was working at the Fed. He was there for the entire five years whilst I was at the Fed. And then he went on to do many exciting things that he's going to talk to us about. So Chris, over to you. Please tell us something about yourself. Yes. So my name is Chris Calavia. And currently I work at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I'm there because I've long had an interest in working internationally on issues that matter to public policy and so on. When I was growing up, I was always interested in other cultures and languages and also exploring cuisines from around the world. In high school, my German teacher had encouraged me to apply for a fellowship to study abroad, and I actually won the fellowship and spent my junior year living in Germany and living with a local family and attending a high school there. And then after college, I got a chance to go back to do some postgraduate studies in Germany. And when I came back to the U.S., I finished a master's degree in international affairs and international economics at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. And I knew I wanted to do something internationally with my career, wasn't exactly sure quite what. And my thesis advisor at Fletcher 
said to me, Christy, you're really interested in international economics and finance, yet you've never worked in the financial stack. You've never worked for a bank. Why don't you think about something like the Federal Reserve? And I, I knew about the Federal Reserve uh, as a central bank, but I didn't know that they were also a regulator of banks. And so when I applied, they had offered me a job as a bank examiner. And so I joined the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, helping to ensure that banks treated their customers fairly and that they adhered to the U.S. laws and regulations and that they operated safely and soundly. And ultimately, that's where I met you. So while I was at the Fed, I had intended just to be there for a few years, but I, there were so many interesting opportunities to work in both domestic and international financial issues. And I had a chance to work overseas in Switzerland with my wife, and we went to work for a, an international organization that sort of coordinates between central banks in Basel, Switzerland. I got back in time for the financial crisis in the U.S. It started off in 2007, and I think that's about the time that we met, because I remember um, some late nights during the financial crisis, seeing you and many other people in conference rooms and so on. Absolutely, that's right. We, we have some war stories to tell about that time. There, there are quite a few war stories there. Maybe on a different show we could talk about. And so I did that, and I had an opportunity to serve as the chief regulator for one of the largest U.S. banks during the latter half of the crisis, went on to some other leadership roles within the Fed, and then one day I got a phone call encouraging me to have a conversation with people at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And when I got the call, I was a little confused because I thought that the foundation hired mainly doctors. I and mean, I was familiar with the work that they were doing in fighting diseases and so on. Um, but it turns out that they had a program which tries to connect people to formal financial services as a way of helping them lift themselves out of poverty sustainably. People from countries that may be low or middle income countries and may be living in poverty or in remote areas. And I thought that sounded really kind of interesting. And so that's how I ended up at the Gates Foundation. That's great. I know, Chris, that you have an anecdote for us from your work at the Gates Foundation in which you will tell us about the wonderful things that it does. But I also want to tell you how just getting the financial tools to the poor people in these third world countries has done wonders. In my last visit to India, I remember my shoe broke and I went to a roadside shoe cobbler and he did mend my shoes and because it was COVID, he did not want to exchange money with me. I paid him through my mobile phone and that was a small, very small shop there. So it just did wonders for everyone. Yeah, the pandemic has taught us the importance of digital infrastructure and things like digital payments and Many countries like India, in some ways, have been ahead of the United States actually in adopting these cashless payment mechanisms. And so the reason the Gates Foundation works on this is that the founders of the Gates Foundation, Bill Gates and Melinda French Gates, believe very strongly that every person deserves a chance to lead a healthy and productive life. And many people are familiar with the work that the foundation does in, in health, but such as fighting uh, diseases and creating vaccines, especially diseases that affect people in, in lower income countries. But they also address educational issues and inequities around the world, and they focus on economic development. And on that latter point, the team that I joined emphasizes empowering people who are living in poverty, and especially women and girls, to participate fully in the economy by getting access to these financial services tools. And the reason that we do that at the Gates Foundation is that there's a good body of research that suggests that when people who are low income and have access to appropriate digital financial tools, they're actually better able to lift themselves out of poverty because they can make payments more easily and, and more cheaply. They can save more easily. And importantly, they can draw on their friends and family and, and send payments to each other, even if they're working in one part of, of, say, India and their family lives in a very different part, very far away. It's much, much easier to send money that way to help take care of each other. And so I was very impressed with this theoretically, but it really wasn't until I actually met some people whose lives were changed by the access to these tools that I understood the true power that these mobile payment services provide. So I was in Bangladesh in a small vi village outside of Dhaka, the, the capital, and I met a woman who told me that she had been working very hard to try to earn some money and her husband was working very hard, but he had trouble finding the steady work and they wanted to buy a bicycle taxi, basically. It's a like a bicycle with an extra seat on it. I I think they're called rickshaws in some places. Yes, exactly. So she, that's what they wanted to buy for him so that he could have more steady work. But they had trouble saving money and, and getting the appropriate funds together. But when they got access to a, a mobile payment solution, basically one offered by their phone company, they were able to open an account and they were able to start putting some of the funds aside in that account. And over time, they accumulated enough funds that they could buy this rickshaw or this uh, bicycle taxi. And it made it possible for her husband to work more hours and for them to earn more money. And just hearing that story and seeing how positively she viewed this, this service 
really made me realize that this is a, a really powerful tool. And it's not that you gave them any money, but you gave them the tools to earn for themselves, which is it's teaching them how to fish rather than giving them a fish. Exactly. And and that's what I focus on is, is thinking about how can we get this, these tools into more people's hands? Because traditional co- commercial banks, say, for example, have trouble serving people who live in impoverished or rural areas. It, it's very expensive for them to build a branch and hire staff and so on. So for them, it's not very profitable, if and maybe not profitable at all, to set up a branch network in some parts of these countries. But mobile phone providers have a very deep customer base. You know, many people in low and middle income countries have access to phones. And because these are ubiquitous tools, phone companies in Kenya and the Philippines discovered that they could make very basic financial accounts available to people that they could then adopt and use to hold funds and make payments and so on. And they became very popular very quickly. And what is the Gates Foundation role in this? They are providing what? The work that I do is advising regulators. So working with the same types of people uh, in central banks and in regulatory authorities who have jobs a little bit like what you and I have at the Federal Reserve, but encouraging them to think differently about their laws, their regulations, and, and how they license companies. In some countries, it's very difficult to get a license to operate such a service. But because we've shown evidence and a good body of data that shows that when people get access to these types of tools, they can improve their lives, it's persuasive for many countries. And so I work to provide advice and, and research support and so on to regulators in these countries so that they can think differently about the regulatory framework. Great. Thanks for sharing that with us, Chris. I know you're going to tell us a couple more stories from different phases of your life. So ready to hear your next story. I wanted to share with you one story Um, at the New York Fed where you and I both worked. I was lucky enough to become a manager relatively early in my career. And I became a manager in an apartment where I really got along well with all the staff and with the managers there. And it was a very collegial environment, very friendly environment. When I was a named manager, people were very supportive about my promotion to that role. And people were very patient with me as I was learning the ropes of managing projects and so on. We got together for drinks after work periodically or dinner. And in the summertime, someone would host a barbecue and so on. So it was a fun place to work. I then got an invitation to work in another department as a manager. And the department worked on a different set of topics, which I thought would be really interesting to do. So I moved to the department, was very excited. But what I didn't know until I got there was that it did not have that same collegial feeling in the department. And in fact, people didn't really trust each other in this department. Uh, I may, might describe it as, you know, three different camps were in this department, so Camp A, B, and C. And the people in Camp A wouldn't talk to the people in Camp B, and the people in Camp B wouldn't talk to people in Camp A. And the people in Camp C didn't talk to anyone except for themselves. And so it was really hard to share information. Meetings were very awkward because we would ask questions and no one would want to say anything, or they'd wait to hear what other people were going to say first. And I think the work suffered a lot as a result because it's really hard to write good reports and and to draw good insights when the people you're relying on don't trust you or maybe you don't trust them. Mm -hmm. And so I was so disappointed by this. Going to work each week just felt like such a a burden because it was such a a difficult department. And I thought, goodness me, I think I've made a terrible mistake. I wonder if I can undo this. (laughs) Maybe I can go somewhere else. And I talked to some of my mentors and realized that even if I were to look for something, I would be there for several months at least. So I thought, well, let me try to make the best of it. And then I thought, perhaps I should get to know the staff in the department better. And so I started having smaller conversations one-on-one with people. I'd stop by their desk and say hello, might share something about what I had done that weekend. You know, being a New Yorker, interested in food and restaurants is a big topic for many people. And so I would share stories about restaurants I visited or ask for recommendations. I even started writing restaurant recommendations at the end of email messages that I'd send to the team. And gradually people started responding to those informal outreaches. And they would write back to me and say, yeah, that's a great place. Have you tried this other sushi restaurant over on this street? Or or did you see such and such movie? And so on. It took a bit of time, but that slowly filtered into the meetings as well. And, and people started to be a little more relaxed when they came to discussions. And people started sharing a little bit more insight. And I have to say, it didn't work for everybody. There were some people who still were very distrustful. And some people ultimately decided that they didn't want to stay and they left. But over time, we attracted more people to come to the department. And people heard about the things we were doing. 
and I could see that the quality were getting better. The insights were improving. People were sharing information more. So ultimately, I thought it would only last a few months there. When I left four years later, I left with a very heavy heart because I had gotten to like the, the team so much and the work that we were doing, and it, it turned out to be a fun place after all. So it had a happy ending. It, it had a happy ending, yes. But I was very unsure of that at the beginning, I have to confess. So Chris, to the professionals, young or not, who are moving to different jobs, who are like you moving to different departments in the same company, what's your message to them? What should they be doing to make sure that their next experience is a positive one? A great question. So I think do more due diligence. Try to meet people who are working in that department or if it's a different company, try to be introduced to people who are working there and ask them not just about the work, but what it's like to be there and what the work culture is like. Now, I don't think you should always look for the same type of work culture because you can learn new things when you're working differently and in different settings and so on and working with people who, who may have different views from you. But at least make sure that you think you can be compatible with that work. If you're a senior person, I would encourage you to get to know the staff that you're leading, spend time and make sure that they know that you're available and be very open with them. And you don't have to share everything about your private life with them, but, but share some things so that people can think about you as a person and get to know you a little bit better. And I think the same is true for junior people. When you go into an organization, if you're new, very important that people should get to know who you are, but also they should know your value. Because if you're in a more junior role in an organization, there may be many people in those roles. And you'll need to stand out and distinguish yourself a little bit. And so one value you can demonstrate is that you're a hard worker, that you're willing to do the extra effort to learn the job. You're a person who's willing to ask questions. You know, don't be afraid to say, I don't know how to do that, or you know, what would your recommendation be? Ask good questions, but then demonstrate that you're the kind of person who can get things done. Mm -hmm. And Chris, before we go on to your next story, you have been so successful in your professional life. And I'm requesting you to share a couple more tools that professionals can use to get better at what they're doing and climb up the ladder. Yes. So I would say when you get started, make sure you understand the mission of the company that you're in, and then make sure that you can connect your role to that overarching mission. And it might not be completely clear to you, so you might need to talk with your boss or with colleagues, but make sure you understand that where the reports go that you're working on, or if you're working on a particular process, how does that process fit into the bigger picture? So understand your role and mission, but then also understand what other parts of the company do and how you interface with them. I think networking, getting to know people, and just being open and honest with people. And again, demonstrating that you're a, a good worker and that you're the type of person who gets things done. Thank you for that advice. I think that's going to be valuable. And if I had not asked you this question, I would be shortchanging this interview. But now let's go on to your third and final story. I know you have another one for us. Yes, absolutely. So when I was a young professional and just moved to New York City, I, I didn't know the city very well but I definitely wanted to get involved in the community outside of work. And I liked my job with the Fed, but I also wanted to do other things as well and, and, and contribute back to society in some way. But I didn't know much about the types of organizations that were out there and, and where I could work. So I did talk to someone who recommended a community center on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And what was unique about this community center was that it was open to adults who were formerly homeless. So these are people who now were in uh, houses or apartments again, and many of them had job placements or were training to get job placements and so on. These adults were being reintegrated into society, and they would come to this community center after hours to relax over games of dominoes or cards. Sometimes there'd be workshops there for them, but they could also have their meals there as well. And so I uh, arrived on a Saturday and, and got a sense of the place, and I could see that it was very important work, and that my sense was that they were trying to restore the uh, sense of dignity in people, which I think is critical, especially for people who had, who had once been homeless and going through very difficult times. But at the same time, it was a very demanding place. The director told me that he wanted me to come every Saturday for a certain number of hours, and then at least once a week during the week for a certain number of hours. I will confess, I was in my mid-20s at that time. I was getting to know the city. I had some friends in the city. There were many things that I wanted to do. And I was a little overwhelmed by that level of commitment uh, for a volunteer job. So actually, I decided to stop volunteering there. 
I, I did it for about six weeks and realized it was too much for me. And I offered my apologies. And then someone at work a few weeks later told me about a place called New York Cares. And this is an organization that's like a clearinghouse. It, it connects volunteers with volunteer projects. And so what you do is you sign up for an orientation session. And then when I first joined, they would mail you a calendar every month telling you about dozens of projects available each week. Nowadays, it's all online, so you can look online and see what's available. But there are just so many projects that involve lots of different opportunities and lots of different organizations. And what I liked about it, again, being in my mid-20s and having many interests and things that I wanted to do, was that there was really no commitment. You could show up for just one session and volunteer for a few hours and be done, or you could volunteer lots of times if you wanted to. And so I started out doing things like helping to clean up parks and, and then one weekend helping to paint a classroom in a public school. And it was a lot of fun until one day I got a call out of the blue from the organization, New York Carriers, and they said, we have this children's project this weekend, taking some kids who are living in a family shelter to a zoo, but we don't have enough chaperones. And if we don't get enough chaperones, we're going to have to cancel the project. And I thought, well, that's terrible. I don't want that to happen. At the same time, I was a little overwhelmed by that because I, I didn't really have any experience working with kids before. I had babysat a couple of times when I was growing up, but that was about it. So I thought I'll, I'll give it a try. But the team leader for this project, who also is a volunteer, made it such a wonderful experience, both for the kids and for the adults who are there as chaperones, that I decided that this was a great project to do. And it was so much fun getting to know a little bit about the kids. Many of them were in heartbreaking situations, coming from essentially broken homes or families that were suffering from addiction or abuse or other things. And so getting them a chance to see a different part of life and go to a zoo or a circus or go ice skating made a difference in, in their lives, at least for that day. And it gave you a sense that kids are really resilient and gave you a, a really sense of, of purpose. Now, after doing that for a few months, that team leader ha had to step down from that role because he was changing jobs. And he asked me if I would take it over. And together with another volunteer, we co-led that project for about eight years, taking kids uh, from this family shelter on field trips once a month. And we had a lot of volunteers, so it was never too overwhelming in terms of the, the kids and the volunteers. So tell us what difference did it make to you in your life and what is your message to the listeners? It made a big difference in my life because I wanted to be more involved with the community and I didn't know how to do that. And so by joining New York Cares, I was put in touch with other organizations that needed volunteers, whether on a short-term basis or a longer-term basis. And for your listeners who are outside of New York City, there's a national organization called pointsoflight.org. This is a website which, similar to the New York Cares website, helps to connect people who want to volunteer with organizations in your community that are looking for people with different skills or interests to do a, a wide variety of projects. So those types of organizations make it a lot easier to navigate the, the world of volunteer work and to find organizations that may align with your values and, and may do things that, where you'd like to share your talents and skills as well. I will have that website on my show notes. But Chris, what I want to ask you is for those who would say, but there is only so many hours in a day and I have to do a full-time job. I'm working 50, 60 hours in a week. I also obviously on the weekends want to have fun with my family or with my friends. Give them a message as to why community service should be part of their busy lives. So what I would say is you know, think about the type of life you want to lead. Think about the type of community you want to live in. Think about the type of world we want to be in. And it takes many people to create a vibrant community. And I think there are so many different ways of, of participating in the community and giving back to the community. It doesn't have to be traditional volunteer work. Sometimes, say, organizing a sports league can be a way to build a sense of community in a neighborhood. Or you can go on the points of light org website and learn about organizations that may need help for sh very short projects, even just one afternoon. I think give it a try and see how you feel about it afterwards. What's wonderful about these types of opportunities, especially volunteer work, is that you meet people from so many walks of life and of all ages. So when I was doing these projects with New York Cares, I of course met lots of young professionals who were interested in getting to know New York City and meeting other people who wanted to make a difference, just as I did. But I also met retirees and senior citizens who had full careers and wanted to give back, who wanted to spend some time with young people, offering them mentoring or helping them with homework or sharing their skills with other people. So it's a great way for you to get involved, to get to know your community a little bit better. I, I went to neighborhoods that I probably would have never had a reason to go to otherwise, and I met people I probably would have never met 
had I not been a volunteer. If you're early in your career, it gives you a chance to create leadership opportunities for yourself. You can get skills if you're helping to manage or organize projects and, and arrange them and making sure that materials are on site if you're doing a painting job or something like that. And you can also make friends for life. In my case, I was helping to organize one of New York Care's annual citywide days of service dedicated to public schools. And there's a really rainy day one year for that particular day of service. And I met a young woman who was just drenched in rain that day and also volunteering with me. She was co-leading at one of the other committees and she became my wife. Oh, that is such a fantastic story. I would love to hear it. Maybe I need to bring you on for another session to, to li listen to just that story. That would be fun. Great, there, Chris. Thank you for your stories. Thank you so much for your insights. It was really great having you on the show. Well, Hamida, let me just thank you for creating this community online and for bringing together so many people from so many walks of life. I've listened to some of the podcasts, as I mentioned, and it's a great opportunity for us to listen to each other, people who may have different backgrounds and perspectives. I want to live in a country and in a world where we listen to each other. I want our kids and your kids and my kids and other people's kids to live in a world where we listen to each other, where we learn from each other, and where we work together to solve common problems so that we can build a better future for ourselves. And you're helping to do this through this podcast by helping us to learn to listen to each other. I truly appreciate that. Thank you so much. The tagline for this show is we are one spirit, one soul, and the stories help us to learn from each other. So thank you for endorsing that, Chris. And thank you for having me, being part of the one spirit and one soul. Listeners, I hope you enjoyed listening to our conversation as much as I enjoyed having it. Chris provided some very insightful professional life lessons and his work at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is noteworthy because centered on the foundation's mission, it impacts livelihoods of so many, especially of women who otherwise would remain in poverty. As always, here are my key takeaways from Chris's professional life lessons. One, for a positive experience, do your due diligence on the new company or new department you are moving to. Prior to accepting the role, try to meet with people who are working there and ask them not just about the work, but also about what it is like to work there and what the work culture is. Two, share a few personal things about you with your colleagues and managers that enable them to feel connected with you as a person. Three, if you are a junior person in a new role, it is very important that people get to know you. There may be many people in the same role as you are and you'll need to stand out and distinguish yourself. Don't be afraid to ask questions, to say, I don't know how to do that, or what would be your recommendations? More importantly, demonstrate that you are the kind of person that can get things done. Four, make sure you understand the mission of the company that you're in and make sure that you can connect what you're doing in your role to that overarching mission. And lastly, there are so many ways of giving back to a community in order to create the type of community you want to live in and also the type of world you want to be in. Chris's last message was that he wants to live in a world where we listen to each other. He wants our children to grow up in a world where we listen and learn from each other. If we wish the same for ourselves and our children, then let's ask ourselves, what are we doing about it? This brings us to the end of this episode. Please remember to subscribe to Sharing Life Lessons YouTube channel, the link for which is in the show notes. I will bring you the next episode of Sharing Life Lessons next Wednesday. Until then, be happy, be safe, and be yourself.